Wildflower Society, the local Blue Ridge one, and which is there a, a part of the state level as well. So she teaches plant science and dendrology. Uh, she has a background in forestry, so she is extremely knowledgeable about plants. And we want to. She wants to talk to you about the what what are plants good for, their relationship with pollinators, um, and some plants that you can keep in mind that would be good for pollinators in general. Direction. It, I was trying to decide what you all needed, wanted to hear about, and so I apologize in advance if what I say, some of you already know all of this, or you know. But I'm hoping um, to kind of thank you um, to hit some high points. You know, I was asked, well, how to how to plant for pollinators, and it's it's hard to give specific plants because honestly, we live in a really beautiful area that is so diverse. Like it's hard to say plant this plant, plant that plant. I mean, there are hundreds of species of beautiful native wildflowers that you can choose from. So what I what I decided to do was um, come up with strategies to think about as you choose. And then I've got resources at the end um, of nurseries in the region that sell native plants, um, what to look out for um, in the big box stores in their nurseries with pesticides. I just attended I worked a webinar with the Xerces Society last week and there was some interesting kind of scary statistics that I hadn't heard about, you know, and if you have bees that are going to be on your plants. So I kind of took it from there. So, and, and um, anyway, I'll just get started and see, <laughs> see if this works. So I'm going to talk about what is pollination anyway, because the other thing that we see with the diversity of, of plants is what is it the pollinators are, are looking for. And the, the different flower structures out there. Natives and non-natives, of course we want to go for the natives, but sometimes non-natives aren't that bad, you know, and so we're going to look at what makes a non-native okay. Um, considerations when choosing the plants, and then helpful resources. I got so many resources, that's why I thought if I, if I give you guys the PowerPoint or the PDF afterwards, it has all the links you can easily go down rabbit holes and just spend <laughs> days <laughs> trying to find your what plants. So why do we need pollinators? So it's all about sex, right? So we need pollinators because, see some of this isn't showing up. It's really, when you think about the whole life cycle of a plant, what pollinators are helping with is just such a, they just need to get the pollen from here to here. Like that's really all that, that needs to happen and if that doesn't happen, then the whole rest of the cycle doesn't happen, right? So you have to have, so pollination isn't the same as fertilization. Pollination is just getting the, female, the male reproductive part from the stamens over to the female reproductive part, the pistil, and then hoping that that pollen drills a pollen tube down into the ovary and fertilizes the eggs. And then you've got the seeds, the embryos, and that starts the process over again. And it seems like such a simple process, but then when you look at the diversity of floral structures, there are some plants, like what we see here is called a perfect flower. You have both male and female parts on the same plant. It can self-fertilize. But so many of our species have separate male and female plants, and you have to be aware of that. Or and we can call it monoecious or dioecious, or they might have both male and female flowers on the same plant, but those plants really require the pollinators, right? Because if, if they don't have it as simple as this, you've got to have, you know, wind or water or that, that insect to take that pollen from the male structure to the, the female structure. And of course we know that flowering plants are tremendously important from an economic standpoint. Um, and what we're concerned with today here in this group is more of the ecological importance. Um, we have so, I mean, just the wide variety of plants is amazing. This is ghost pipe that's native here. That is a, people tend to think that's a fungus. That's actually a flower. It's a parasitic flower. It's, it's feeding on sugars from the fungal mycorrhizae in the soil. And that is a flower. If you lift these up, you'll see the stamens and the pistils inside. And they have a specific fly-like pollinator that, that they depend on. So, the color's kind of bright here. Sorry about that. I'm not sure if I can adjust it on the screen. Yeah, you want to try? Or... I know, it's like you're free. Pollinator. So there was this first of, 
of species diversity in flower and plants and an equal burst in diversity of their pollinators. And you can see they can be very, very <coughs> specific, right? Like there are pollinators, there are some plants like the yucca that we have here in Virginia that relies on the yucca moth. The yucca moth can only reproduce in the yucca. That if, if the yucca moth isn't there to pollinate the yucca flower, then it's not going to reproduce. And if the yucca isn't there, the yucca moth isn't going to survive. So, so some of the relationships are very, very, um, very particular. This is a carrion flower. This is a tropical variety. You guys know what carrion is, right? That's what it sounds like. And we have those here. So like here's some native plants here that our honeybees probably wouldn't be crazy about, but they're great for our native pollinators. This is our carrion flower. It looks a lot like greenbrier. In fact, sometimes I think I've probably told my students I'm showing them greenbrier and I'm probably showing them carrion. They're in the same genus. Um, but if you put your nose up to that, it's like you're smelling roadkill. It is the strongest smell I have ever <laughs> And you know, when I had my field guide, the first time I smelled it, I was like, oh, the carrion flower smells like dead meat. And then of course I stuck my nose right in it and it was accurate. <laughs> this is black cohosh. This is native here. If you have a shade garden, now this is a beautiful plant to have in your shade garden. But the, the leaves are this beautiful kind of rounded columbine shape and they have these tall, these beautiful tall spikes. But if you go to smell it, it doesn't smell great because its pollinator is flies. It's not a bad smell. It's not like this, but you definitely, you don't want to plant it for the smell. This is pawpaw, our native pawpaw tree. It's the same way. Its pollinator is flies. It has kind of a weird musky kind of smell. So that's a consideration when you're um, planting some of these native plants, like, you know, what is their specific pollinator partner? And then some of our flowers are kind of tricky, you know, like they have, they're producing nectar to attract the pollinators and then they might have their stamens with the pollen that are like, oh, you want the nectar? Well, we're gonna coat your back in, in <laughs> pollen to go take it to another flower. Our lady slipper orchids, if you guys have seen pink lady slippers and yellow lady slippers, <coughs> so they have this little trick where they, they have the nectar so it attracts the pollinator and they have to go down in a little hole in the sack. And once they go in, they can't back out. It's a trap. And when they, the only way out is to climb out the upper part. And in the process, the stamens are hanging down on the roof on the inside of that flower. So as the, as the bee goes in, its whole back is getting brushed with pollen. And then when it comes out, then it goes to find another flower and it pollinates the flower. So the, it's amazing, you know, the flowers just over these millions of years have evolved these incredible tactics. And of course now we know, you guys are beekeepers, so you know that the bees don't see the flowers the same way we see the flowers, right? Like we just see an orange California poppy or this is a pink um, evening primrose, oh and Othera. These are, uh, no, the sun drops that are all over the sides of the road. In the, in the summertime, and the, view, the bees see the UV light, so they see a target mark, right? So it's just saying, this is a dandelion. So they're seeing that sign of come here, right? Like here's, here's where I, I need to go. And the other thing, and I'll talk about this later, is while we're looking at this, is not only do the bees have a target mark, but these, these petals make really nice landing pads. Like think of flowers as landing pads. You know, you wanna have flowers that are, easy for your bees to land on and access the nectar and access and then get pollen on them at the same time. And then I found this the other night when I was putting this together. This is one I didn't even know about. Of course, this is barberry and mahonia. These are invasive here. You wouldn't want to plant these anyway. But they have, okay, so they have nectar in the flowers and they have everything in pairs. So they've got two nectar glands, but between the nectar glands, their stamens are stuck there with a hair trigger. So the bees come in, they fly in to get to the nectar, and the only way to get to it, they have to trip that, that switch on the stamen. And the stamen flies up and hits them in the face and completely covers them with pollen and scares them away. And apparently, <laughs> apparently they want them to do that. So they did in this study, these people somehow like glued down the stamens so they wouldn't pop up. And they, they saw that there was actually less productivity 
if the bees didn't get hit in the face with the stage and <laughs> covered in pollen. I just wish there was a video. As I was reading it, I wanted to, this, is, this was the quote I got directly. So the stamens are inserted paired between paired nectar glands when touched by an insect's tongue, rapidly snap forward so that their anthers press pollen on the insect's tongue or face. It's like a pie in the face kind of thing. <laughs> All right, so why plant native? I think everyone at this point is really familiar with this. There's, the natives are adapted to our climate, right? So there's less watering. They, they can tolerate drought and heavy rain. Whatever we normally get, they can tolerate it. They also need less fertilizer. They're adapted to our soils. Um, they can even help improve our soil quality. They're tolerant of native pathogens. You know, they're still gonna get the same bacteria and fungal and viruses, but they can, but they're used to this area, so they can they can tolerate them. Um, and they're adapted to our climate, so there's there's less babying is how I I thought about it. You know, you don't need to do all the pruning and the taking care of, you know, they can they can last through the winter and be just fine. And our natives tend my new thing I've noticed in the winter is they I'm just noticing more they have beautiful, I don't know if you want to call skeletons, you know, they're remnants in the flower garden. Some are just absolutely gorgeous. You can make nice like fall arrangements just with the leftover um, you know, the seed pods. Yeah. Oh, you're fine. Sometimes we like non-natives though. So I'm I'm really not a purist. Like I've got a mix. I, I have natives scattered around our property at, off, off Lee's Gap Road. I'm, I'm planting ramps and Virginia bluebells. We've got bloodroot everywhere. But I still like, I've got my herb garden. Like I like my lavender and my rosemary and sage. And then um, I do like, I, you know, as long as they're not invasive, I like my native, my non-native flowering. Like I ordered ranunculus bulbs the other day just because I like them. They're not pollinator friendly at all, but I like them, right? So, so when you look at non-natives, I've got some categories, some things you want to think about um, if you do want to mix in some, some non-natives. And one thing that um, you have to really think about with these horticultural varieties is they have what they might call native ours. I don't know if you've heard that term, where they take a native plant, like say rhododendron, and they come up with all these different varieties of it, and they call it a, a native R, right? So sometimes they can really come up with these wild floral plants, like, like coneflower, echinacea. Here is the native variety. And if you look at it, there's a nice landing pad, right? So the petals are open. It's revealing all of the floral organs in the middle. And, but it's a beautiful flower. So if you look at the nursery industry, the horticultural trade, they've come up with so many different varieties. And so they have a newer one that's like this lime green. But looking at what the bees see, the bees don't see the landing pad, right? So when the leaves are the the petals are close to the same color as the lead as the leaves, as they're flying around, they're not seeing that target mark reaching out at them, right? So that's not as visible to the bees. Um, this is one they created a double. So this is so we tend to like double flowers because they're real frilly and they're real pretty. But what happening there is they've made a genetic switch to make those stamens turn into petals. So a lot of times these double flowers aren't, they're sterile, there's, there's no petals. And I actually noticed it when I, when I was putting it together, all of the daffodils are blooming in our yard and um, we've got some old heirloom doubles that come up every year. And I, I looked at them and I've got the traditional ones here and I'll pass these around. You can see the traditional ones have the full set of stamen and pistols. But if you look in the, if you look in the doubles, the doubles are beautiful and they smell good. They're producing the nectar, but there's no stamens in there. There's no, those are, there's no pollen. There's nothing to help with reproduction. And feel free to take a flap. I've got hundreds like dissected if you want <laughs> as, they, as they come around. Pull it apart and you see you won't see much. So that's something to think about. Same, and same with the roses. So you've got your native rose that is that simple form and there's all the pollen and the nectar. And then you look at the cultivated roses and they can't, I don't even know if there's stamens in there. These might be sterile, but even if there are stamens, the bees can't get, can't get in there. 
And then this is a, a native bar that looks, that's actually a good one. It looks like the, na the native one is just a little deeper pink. You know, that's, that's still good too. So that's just something to think about if you want to mix in non-natives. You want to think about what's accessible for the bees, because the bees do need the, you guys are beekeepers, I'm still learning. They do need the pollen, right? Because they need, for the propolis, <coughs> that's what I thought. All right, so I'm still learning. Pollen, I'm the pollen the is the protein. Pollen is the protein. Pollen is the protein. the protein. And they use the nectar also. That's right? the yeah, carbohydrate. The that's carbohydrate. The carbohydrate. All right, so their carbs and their proteins are all in there. Right. So you want to make sure your flowers have the full set. And when they're in this bubble phase, they're pretty, but they don't necessarily have everything that, that's needed. Um, also, so this was something I found recently. I hadn't really thought about this. Um, so like, here's another native bar, nine bark. It's a shrub you can find in the woods all around here. It looks like a viburnum. Um, it's really popular for, not, for native plantings. And they've come up with all kinds of cultivars. And they have one that's like a copper leaved color. And that copper color is from anthocyanins. It's that purple pigment. Which for us is great. We like it because it's if it's in fruits, it's antioxidants. But it's apparently toxic to caterpillars. Hmm. So if they eat too much of the leaves and they and they've got high levels of those anthocyanins, that can be not so great for, for um, the butterflies and the and the moths. So some, something else to consider. I actually didn't didn't know that before I found this. So when so looking at some other considerations, you know, it's hard for me to come up with specifics. I'll give some examples, but I thought, okay, I guess if I had bees on my property and we now have bees on campus, so that's we're learning after the fact, <laughs> after getting the bees. I guess you would want to try and stat have your plantings staggered so that you always have something blooming, yeah. right? Um, so I thought the earliest you can start right now with the spring ephemerals, they're coming up right now. I noticed the hepaticas um, are blooming on our creek yesterday. Um, the bloodroot will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, trillium, cardinal flower, um, no, it's not cardinal flower, fire pink, um, trout lilies, trout lilies will be coming up real soon. So, so these ephemerals, I put, I call them the early birds. These are those beautiful, I mean, this is so Appalachian. I love our ephemerals. This is what I love to watch for in the spring. So these are the plants that take advantage of those first warm spring days, but the leaves on the trees aren't out yet. So they're taking advantage of sunlight that's still hitting the ground, and they're coming up, and they're blooming for like a week, and then they're gone, and by June, you have no idea that they're there. Like, that's why they're called ephemerals. They're so, like, they're like a little treasure to find in the woods. Um, so you've got your, your orchids. We have so many neat little orchid species, the May apples. So I would start, if I was starting over again, I would, um, I would have some ephemerals scattered around that can get, um, get everyone dizzy know, before everything else comes out. <coughs> Spring and summer blooms, this was so overwhelming, I didn't even know what to put, <laughs> to put on a slide, because there's so many. I'm going to show you resources that I have on the table and, and online resources. Um, you know, everything blooms later in the, in the spring and summer, and, you know, it, it depends on, um, is your site shady or sunny? What kind of soil do you have? You know, there's just hundreds to choose from. We've got, I've got the black cohosh here. That's great for shady, rich soils. This is cardinal flower. This is great for wetter sites. Um, um, bee balm, Monarda, is um, a great mint that establishes easily. And then these can handle really tough conditions. These are those sun drops, the Oenotheras and the evening primrose. You see these growing on the roughest roadsides up on the mountains on this clay, shaley, they can grow anywhere and they just have these beautiful, beautiful blooms. But there's a lot to choose from. And then you go into fall and I would focus on the golden rods, the asters, the rubecchios or the black eyed Susans, Joe Pye weed, New York ironweed. I found a picture with all of them in there. The fall, I mean, you can have blooms going up through October. They're just, there's so many species of each one of these. The goldenrods in themselves are just gorgeous.
So I guess that's what I would do. I would I would try and pick species that that start mm. early and then just keep rolling, you know, with a new round of, of pollen pollen selection every every month. Um, and then also you want to think about your site. Is it a shady site or a sunny site? And you can even, you know, stagger, like if you've got a tree creating shade, you can still have ephemerals under here because it'll, it'll be basically full sun before the leaves come out. So you can still have that whole mix of um, the whole season of flowering as you, as you go along. <laughs> Um, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, um, the, a new consideration that I hadn't thought of was the nursery source. And I, I mentioned I sat in on a Xerces Society web, uh, webinar. So the Xerces Society um, runs the, campus, the B Campus and B City program. And they have um, a lot of resources for it. Now their focus is native pollinators, not so much honeybees, but they, they did an interesting study on toxins or pesticide residues that you find on nursery plants, even if they have the wildlife tags on them. Um, so they found that there were several ways that pollinators can be exposed to these pesticide residues. Obviously they can be sprayed directly if they're in the nursery or in the vicinity of the nursery. Um, they can come in contact with residues after the plants are sprayed. If the plants are sprayed, this is a tougher one for us as consumers, if the plants are sprayed with systemic, you know, the, the ones that come up into the roots and they're in the tissues, those don't wash off. So if you buy plants that have been given some type of application of a systemic spray, anything that consumes the plant material from that can get the residues from that spray. And then if, they're, if that insect is higher on the food chain, it can eat contaminated prey, right, that's been exposed. Um, so you can have kind of a biomagnification going on there. And they did some studies at some local, not, not, they, they did, it sounded like, they didn't say names, but it sounded like they went to chain, like box store kind of nurseries, which is where most people go, right, the Lowe's and the Home Depot's. And they found one study at a retail nursery found two to 28 different pesticide residues per plant that were from the wholesaler. Um, even plants that had wildlife safe tags had fungicides at toxic levels. And what they found was that they actually interviewed nursery worker, nursery owners, and they were like, you know, they're kind of under pressure. You know, if you're growing plants in an environment like this, where everything's tightly controlled and tightly packed in, and then you get a pathogen come in, I mean, there's your, your stock, your inventory's gone. So they, they have to have some kind of control. And one nursery owner was very blunt, just said, hey, look, you know, 26% of my costs are for labor. Chemicals are just 2%. It's, I can save a whole lot more money if I just use spray chemicals to control pests than to have labor, you know, have people out there picking the things off. Um, the Xerces Society said there are ways you can work with nurseries. So what they suggest is that if I, yeah, solutions. Get to know your local nurseries, um, especially our small time, you know, individual business owners. They're not probably going to be spraying as, as many chemicals, but just ask them what they spray. You know, what are, what are the pesticides you're using? Most of them don't mind asking, especially if you're nice about it. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, ask, get to know them, what are, know what they're spraying. Ask them, you know, okay, if you're spraying on, in this month, you know, what if I came back next month would the residues have been gone? Um, so just get to know your, your local nurseries. I think that's the main thing. And I guess from what I learned from that webinar, stay away from the big box stores because you really don't know where it's, where it's coming from. Okay, the resources. All right, so if you're interested in just learning wildflowers with going out on your own first, um, some sources you can use are the Flora of Virginia app, which has an initial, an initial cost, it's on the app store, um, of like $20, but once it's downloaded, it's a, it's a one-time fee and then it works even when you don't have Wi-Fi, it's great. Um, and then online, the same digital plant atlas is online, you can look up plants there. 
um, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Resources Natural Heritage Site has native plant lists. And then the Virginia Native Plant Society is a great resource. But for finding actual plants, a new book came out this year from, oops, the, it's a guide to gardening in Southwest Virginia. Have you guys seen that? Yes. It just came out. Yeah, they've been from our library. Yeah, they've been sending out boxes and boxes of it. I didn't even know when it came out. So I'm the treasurer of our Blue Ridge Wildflower Society, and I got a phone call. You have 10 cases waiting. <laughs> How many did you bring tonight? I only brought two, and I should have brought a whole box. I know, I should have brought more, but I found it's free online. This is a free PDF. Our right public here. libraries were, had free copies that if, if you were, you could go and each family could get that's free. Yeah. That's, so that's the extension on. office. Mm -hmm. You get yeah. a free. Um, I'm a master gardener and we were part of that program. So if you want one, you can buy it. Yeah, the yeah, the extension offices